Hey Duke basketball fans, it's Pete Winkler with your first episode of the Duke Basketball PhD course. In this course, I'll talk about the rich and outstanding history of Duke basketball over the last 50 years. We'll take a look at teams from the past and players from the past, and then the team and players from today, and talk about all of them in historical context. It will be an educational, provocative, and always fun look at Duke basketball. Before I dive in and get started, could I ask you to please subscribe to my channel on YouTube? I first became a Duke basketball fan during the 1977-78 season. You remember that legendary Duke team that made that Cinderella run out of obscurity and made it all the way to the NCAA tournament finals? That team was led by Duke all-time stars Mike Jaminski, Jim Spinarkle, and Gene Banks. At that time and forever forward, I became a Duke basketball fan with great love and passion for Duke basketball. That great team was memorialized in John Feinstein, Duke grad, sports writer extraordinaire's book, Forever's Team, which I highly suggest you read. After growing up as a Duke basketball fan during my teenage years, I had the privilege and the opportunity to attend Duke University as an undergrad from 1987 to 1991. You may remember that those four years were all final four years for Duke basketball. My senior year, Duke made it all the way to the NCAA championships after an amazing upset of UNLV in the national semifinals. I like to look at that era as the beginning of the golden era of Duke basketball in the late 80s and early 1990s. At that time, Duke went to five straight Final Fours and seven out of nine Final Fours. It culminated with Coach K's first national championship in 1991. I sat in the stands at the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis and watched Grant Hill, Bobby Hurley, Christian Leitner, and an amazing cast of Duke players take home the national championship after upsetting UNLV in an amazing game in the semifinals. They beat Kansas in the finals and took it all. Since then, my senior year in 1991, and over the next 33 years, I've studied Duke basketball closely, developed into a super fan, and have now become a self-proclaimed professor of Duke basketball. The idea of this course is to discuss Duke's rich history of basketball, the amazing teams and players, and to put that into historical context with the teams, team and players of today, and to overall raise your Duke basketball IQ. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about this season's Duke basketball team, the 23-24 team. Talk about how they're doing, where they stand, what the rest of the season looks like, and how some of the players are doing on the team, and how they compare to some of the great teams and players of Duke history past. So let's get started. At this point in the season, Duke is through 16 of its 20 ACC conference games and stands with a conference record of 12 wins and 4 losses, an overall record of 21 wins and 6 losses. It's been a solid season so far after a fairly slow early start with a record of 5-3. and three, Since then, Duke has won 16 out of its last 19 games and has really uh, picked up steam and is looking ever better, including a 29-point win on the road against Miami last Wednesday. The four remaining games on the ACC schedule include today's home game at Cameron against Louisville, a home game against Virginia on Saturday, a road game next week against North Carolina State, and then the regular season concludes, of course, with our twice-annual slugfest against North Carolina. This one will be at home in Cameron. So three of the next four games on the road, I believe that Duke is going to win uh, all of those home games and uh, may win the NC State game, although it's always tough for us at Raleigh. And uh, if they win three out of those four games, they'll conclude the regular season with a 24 and seven record overall, 15 and five in the ACC. In general, I like the way this season's team is shaping up. While last Saturday's game at Wake Forest was a tough loss, it came following five consecutive Duke wins, including road wins at Florida State and at Miami, which were our tough places to play on the road, and Duke performed in excellent fashion during those games. For me, and this is probably a contrarian take, my co-MVPs of this season's Duke team are 
guard Jeremy Roach and forward Mark Mitchell. Not Kyle Filipowski, who's, you know, everybody's All-American and a great player, but Jeremy and Mark. The reason why is that uh, Jeremy is a senior leader of the Duke team. He's a great clutch performer. Uh, he kind of reminds me of Quinn Cook and the way Quinn developed in 2015 on that team that made a run uh, with Quinn along with uh, great freshmen like Justice Winslow, Jalil Okafor, and um, Grayson Allen, and Tyus Jones made a run all the way to win the NCAA Finals, Duke's last NCAA Final winner. This team reminds me of that team. It's picking up pace and momentum. It's led by a, a senior in Jeremy Roach, and Jeremy is critical. Also, Interestingly, Jeremy has really improved his shooting. Jeremy currently sports a shooting line of 49% from the field overall, 47% from three-point range, which is excellent, and 87% from the free throw line. This represents a significant improvement in Jeremy's shooting from the last three years and is kind of the extra edge that I think can help Duke you know, get past some of the tougher teams in March Madness. My other co-MVP from this season's Duke team is power forward Mark Mitchell. Mark's a great player and all, all heart, effort, hustle. Mark reminds me of great players from the Duke past, like Gene Banks, the talented uh, power forward who was a great inside player and scorer. Luol Dang, who was a, a slasher and could get to the basket and had a nice shooting touch. And Billy King, who was a, a great Duke star on defense. Um, kind of all rolled into one. Mark's got that kind of ability and potential. Interestingly, when Mark scores in double figures in those games during his first almost two seasons at Duke, Duke is 30 wins and three losses. When Mark doesn't score in double figures, they are 16 and 10. So that's a really interesting bellwether, whether or not Mark scores in double figures. Interestingly, uh, Mark has also really improved his outside shooting. Earlier in the season, he was at 1.2 for 20 from three-point range. Since ACC play started, he's about 7 out of 15 from three-point range, so a significant improvement. Although that's not really Mark's game. Mark's game is slashing, getting to the basket, and either scoring or drawing a foul or dishing off to somebody with an open shot. Mark does so much for Duke. He can drive to the rim. He can rebound both on offense and defense. He's an excellent passer and he's very versatile on defense. He can guard all five positions on defense. As far as this season's Duke team goes, they could be like the 2001 Duke championship team, which was led by sophomores, Jay Williams, Mike Dunleavy, and Carlos Boozer. We have three great sophomores just like that on this season's Duke team in Kyle Filipowski, Mark Mitchell, and Tyrese Proctor. One more point I wanted to touch on. So today it's Wednesday, February 28th, 2024. Four days ago, last Saturday, Duke lost a close game at Wake Forest at Larry Joel Coliseum, after which Wake Forest fans stormed the court and Kyle Filipowski uh, had sustained a leg injury in the process. I have a real problem with court storming, like a lot of Duke fans probably, especially in a situation where one of our players gets hurt, it's gotta stop. And it was funny to me because I've never seen a court storming at Cameron Indoor Stadium in all the many years I've been following Duke basketball. I think it's because Duke uh, takes the game seriously, Duke fans respect the game, and they expect to win against any opponent that comes into Cameron Indoor Stadium. Obviously, it's different for Wake Forest fans, but I have to say, Wake Forest fans, your team was favored to win the game. So it wasn't that big a surprise uh, at the end of the game. So why were you storming the court in the first place? But who, who I really hold at fault in this situation is the ACC conference for not having had a policy in place regarding court storming. For instance, the SEC conference imposes fines on the host school for instances of court storming, and those fines rise as you go, as the, there are more incidents. The ACC has no policy like that. Additionally, Wake Forest administration dropped the ball on this one. The Wake Forest administration should have had a policy in place already where they made an announcement before the end of the game that said court storming before all the players have left the uh, court is prohibited 
and uh, there'll be sanctions against those fans who are who are caught storming the court before they should be. Anyway, the beat goes on. Today, Duke plays at home against Louisville, uh, who's at the bottom of the uh, ACC. So I expect a return to winning ways from our Duke boys and for really excellent uh, play throughout the rest of the season and into the NCAA tournament. Go Duke! If you like this video, please press the like button, hit subscribe, and also leave me a comment to let me know what you'd like me to cover in future episodes of the PhD course in Duke basketball. I'm Pete Winkler, Duke superfan and self-proclaimed professor of Duke basketball. Watch out for our next episode of the Duke Basketball PhD course that'll be coming out to you soon.